Today in the Physics Funhouse, we're going to be investigating the impulse momentum theorem, which is another statement of Newton's second law that we learned earlier. And so the impulse momentum theorem relates the terms momentum with the term impulse. So those are two new terms, so let's briefly discuss both of those. Isaac Newton actually wrote his second law of motion in these terms, and he defined the term momentum to be the quantity of motion arising from both its mass and velocity conjunctly. So that's a fancy way of saying that momentum is simply mass times velocity. And so when we say the quantity of motion, or how much, some, how much motion something has, that's what we're referring to. We're referring to momentum. The second new term is the term impulse. Impulse is the area of a force versus time graph, kind of like you see over here on the left. So what we're going to do to investigate this is use a force sensor on one of our smart carts, like right there. Um, and we're going to pull it with a mass attached to a string. So we're going to attach it to a 200 gram mass. And we're going to exert a force on it. And then what we're going to try to do is see if there is a relationship between those two terms, momentum and impulse. And so that cart right there is loaded up with mass, got it pretty heavy, um, a mass of two kilograms. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure the impulse using our force sensor and finding the area under the graph as well as the velocity and see if we can figure out how the impulse affects the velocity. Let's get started. Alrighty, so we've got our cart loaded up with two kilograms of mass. We've got the string tight. I'm going to press record on capstone and I'm going to let it go. That was fast. And I'm going to let it go. That was fast. Okay, so let's investigate our data real quick. So you can see there at the left of about two seconds how the tension in the string was relatively constant. And then I let it go, and it kind of bounces just a few times, and then it becomes constant for about a second, and then it drops as I caught it. And then over here on the velocity time graph, you can see it starts at zero, and then rockets upward to about well, 1.1 or so before dropping to zero as I caught it. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom our data in on just that period of time when the cart was accelerating down the track. And I'm looking for the most consistent data on my force graph, which is from about 2.6 to about 3.4 seconds. So I'm going to do that trick where I draw a box around 2.6 to 3.4. And I'm going to click the area button on that to get the impulse. And so right there, I've got an impulse of 1.41 newtons times seconds. So let's see if we can relate that to the velocity change. So what I'm going to do over here on my velocity time graph is zoom in on that same region from 2.6 to 3.4 seconds. I'm going to use the coordinate tool here. So I can get the exact value of the velocity at 2.6 seconds. So that's 0 0.332 meters per second. That's going to be our initial velocity. So change in velocity is final minus initial. So I'm going to put that at the end of that. And that was 0 0.332 meters per second. And then our final velocity will be the velocity at 3.4 seconds. So let's bring it up here to about 3.4, where I've got a velocity of 1.01 .01 meters per second. So I've got some data for a force and therefore an impulse, impulse of 1.41 newtons per second, and then some change in velocity data, which I can then use to find a change in momentum. So let's proceed and see if there is some sort of relationship. Okay, so in that experiment, we took a cart of mass two kilograms, and we accelerated it from an initial velocity of 0.332 meters per second to a final velocity of 1.01 .01 meter per second by exerting an impulse of 1.41 newton time seconds on it. So doing some math manipulation with these numbers, we can calculate the change in momentum of our cart. 
And so by multiplying the mass by the change in velocity, because remember that momentum's definition is mass times velocity, I can get a value for the momentum change of 1.36, and the unit for right now is just kilogram times meter per second. So everything in the parentheses is meters per second times kilogram, looks like that. So what you'll notice is that that number right there, one point about four, give or take, is almost exactly identical to that number of about 1.4, give or take. And so within experimental error, we're, we're talking about, what, five one hundredths of a newton time second, we can state that the impulse is equal to the change in momentum of that cart. And so that is our new statement of Newton's second law, also known as the impulse momentum theorem. Impulse is equal to a change in momentum. So up until this point, we haven't given impulse a symbol. We defined it as being the area of a force versus time graph, but I didn't really give you a symbol for it yet. And the reason is the symbol we're going to use in physics one is simply delta P. So when I want to write impulse equals area of force versus time, I can write delta P equals area of force versus time. In future courses, you might also see the symbol J. That's the most common one in like calculus-based physics classes. And there are still some people out there who use the symbol I for impulse as well. So if you see those in future courses, just realize that those are just different symbols for impulse. In this course, we're going to use delta P. So our next step is to figure out why that's a statement of Newton's second law. So how is that the same as acceleration equals net force over mass? And why is restating it in terms of momentum helpful? So let's investigate that next. Okay, so we found in our experiment that our impulse momentum theorem says the impulse is equal to a change in momentum. And I told you that that was another statement of Newton's second law. So let's investigate exactly how those two are equivalent. Like our current understanding of Newton's second law looks like that. A equals net force over M. So how is that equivalent to impulse equals change of momentum? And then why is impulse equal change of momentum more useful? So first, let's come over here and investigate what happens when you have a constant force, which is kind of what we deal with most of the time in physics one. So if the force is constant, then the area of the graph would be like the area of a rectangle. And so you would just multiply force, which would be this side of your rectangle, times delta t, which would be this side of your rectangle. And then you can rewrite area as like an equation, like area equals f delta t. So for a constant force, I can write the impulse momentum equation like this, delta P equals F delta T. So let's see how that looks like our first statement of Newton's second law. So doing a little bit of algebra starting from acceleration equals net force over mass, um, I could kind of rearrange it to get net force equals MA, which is how oftentimes we write Newton's second law. And if I remember that acceleration is change in velocity over change in time, I can rewrite it like this, m delta v over delta t. And then if I multiply both sides by delta t, then I get this expression, del net force delta t equals m delta v. And of course, delta m delta v is just delta p. And so what's on the left looks like our impulse equation, F delta T, and what's on the right is delta P. So if we start from our current understanding of Newton's second law, we can get to the impulse momentum theorem algebraically. The problem with this and the limitation of this is that that assumes that the net force, mass, and acceleration are all constants. Like A is a number, net force is a number, M is a number. If we're dealing with a changing force, like a graph that looks like this, then we really can't use that expression because F would be a function, not a number. And so if we come all the way back down to here and we rewrite net force as delta P over delta T, by just solving that for the net force, if we were to write that in calculus terms, it would look like this. And one day you may be in a calculus class and you'll learn what a derivative is, and then you'll recognize that notation. 
that force equals the derivative of P with respect to T. And so what that version of Newton's second law allows us to do is to deal with non-constant masses and accelerations. And so why is it important to be able to deal with non-constant mass? Like, how is the mass of this thing going to be changing? And the answer is it's probably not. However, other things where you might be exerting forces on them might have a changing mass. A good example of that would be a rocket. A rocket works by throwing stuff out the back, and as it throws stuff out the back, it loses mass. And so we can't really understand rocket science without some understanding of the impulse momentum theorem. And so this is a specific version of Newton's second law. This is a more general version of Newton's second law that allows us to understand uh, more things and to make better predictions, especially when things are changing. And here in a few minutes, we're going to start looking at some collisions where the force is definitely not going to be constant. So last thing to kind of talk about, what's the deal with these units over here? Because we got delta P to be in the unit of kilogram times meter per second, and the quantity F delta T was in units of Newton time second. So how can those different units be the same? Well, let's remember that a Newton is really a kilogram times a meter per second squared. And so if we multiply a Newton by another second, the second red second there cancels out with one of the seconds in the denominator, giving us kilogram times meter per second. So the unit for momentum change is the same as the unit for impulse. And so you can write for either kilogram times meter per second, or you can write Newton's time second. So you might think that that unit would have a special name, like kind of like how we have Newton's as our unit for force and joules for energy and volts for electric potential, but there's no agreement on who that should be named after. So I claim it for myself and I call that the Marek. So I hope you've learned a little bit about impulse momentum theorem today. In our next video, we're going to look at how impulse momentum theorem governs what happens during a collision. Till then, ta-ta.